Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today on Plant Your Seed, joining us from upstate New York, we have Dr. Lee Ettinger. Dr. Ettinger is a plant-based pediatrician supporting families, raising plant-based children, and helping families struggling with pediatric obesity. Welcome, Dr. Ettinger. Thank you so much for having me, Fred. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thanks for being here on Plant Your Seed. Let's start with your plant-based journey. How and why did you transition to a plant-based diet? I first learned about the plant-based diet in 2014. I'm an avid cyclist, and I was watching cycling videos on YouTube, and in the suggested feed uh, came a video from a, doc, from, a, from a Dorian rider who is an Australian cyclist, and it was a, a comedy kind of video of him cycling, and it was titled something like uh, Stuff uh, Cyclists Say, and it was, it was really funny, a lot of inside cycling jokes. And so I looked at his other content, uh, looking for more humor, looking for more mm-hmm. comedy. And uh, the next video I watched from him was saying uh, that uh, when you're out cycling, uh, it's best to take the brown spotty banana if you're taking bananas on your ride, because the yellow banana is full of starch. It's going to take hours to digest that starch. You won't feel the energy from that banana until you're after the bike ride sitting on the couch. And so I never thought about that. So mm. I was like, yeah, let me start taking the brown spotty bananas. They have more sugar in them and uh, are going to give me energy to complete my ride. So uh, that made sense to me. I started looking at his other stuff and it turns out that he's a plant-based cyclist and he's biking all over Australia, like eating rice and mangoes. And I'm <laughs> thinking, how, how's he doing that? How's that possible? Where does he get his protein? Sure. Uh, so uh, he talks a lot about the plant-based diet. He talks a lot about veganism for sure for the animals. Uh, but he also uh, gave me kind of resources, gave me ways to learn more about the plant-based diet, talking about other doctors. And as a doctor, I, I wanted to hear what other doctors had mm. to say about this. So I wanted to, because I, I had no previous uh, idea that this existed out there, really, uh, for athletes per se. Mm-hmm. I had met vegans before, but um, this uh, cyclist who was benefiting from it, I thought maybe I could learn about it and it could benefit my cycling. So I started to look into Dr. Um, I really like Dr. McDougall's work um, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, his books and his videos online and uh, Dr. Esselstein, Dr. Campbell and and uh, Nutrition Facts with Dr. Gregor. So I uh, really started to learn a, a lot about it from the scientific studies and made, made changes in my own life and saw some benefits pretty quickly. So it stuck. Now, what was it about that cyclist's videos that resonated with you? Just looking for a benefit for my cycling, honestly. Mm-hmm. I, you know, uh, seemed like he had a lot of energy and he was lean and uh, this was helping his cycling. So my initial uh, goals were a legal and an ethical boost uh, to my cycling. Um, so, uh, and uh, sure enough, I, I started to lose weight and I lost about 20 pounds over a year, year and a half, which is certainly going to help your biking going uphill. Uh, versus gravity, mm-hmm. but had some other benefits too, like my my blood pressure, which was a little bit high. I came back down to normal. My cholesterol, which had always been a little bit elevated, normalized too. Uh, so I started to see these benefits, and sure enough, my my cycling was getting better and better. So it was very uh, like positive reinforcement. Now, how did you make the transition? Obviously, you're a dad with three kids, and your wife. How did you bring that to them? Yeah, at first I just started kind of removing stuff from my own diet, animal products. I can't put an exact date on it, um, but yeah, with the family, certainly that's a consideration. Uh, But uh, my wife was like, what are you doing? Why aren't you eating that? (laughs) And uh, she was concerned at first uh, about it. But uh, we started to watch the documentaries together, um, like uh, Forks Over Knives and Mm -hmm. What the Hell and Cowspiracy. And she really enjoys podcasts too. And she um, really uh, latched onto Rich Roll and mm-hmm. his podcast. And uh, really that I think was what really sealed the deal for her hearing from him uh, about the benefits of the plant-based diet in, in his interviews 
Uh, so yeah, she made the switch with me that summer of 2014. My three kids at the time were in elementary school. And uh, at first they didn't notice anything. It took them about two weeks to notice that the the, the dairy milk had turned into a plant-based milk. The, the, the carton was different. They were like, wait, this carton, this carton. So they didn't even notice that. Um, but uh, yeah, they, so uh, they were in elementary school. So they were basically feeding uh, and uh, eating what we were, were serving them um, and kind of explained to them at age appropriate mm-hmm. kind of ways uh, why we're making the decision. And for my two daughters, it was kind of like, they were such animal lovers. They're like, oh, so we don't have to eat the animals. We, we're down with that. That's no, that sounds great. Uh-huh. We don't want to eat the animals. Uh, um, and initially my son, um, he had dreams at the time of being a, a football player. Um, and uh, he wanted to know if he could get big and strong, like a football player. Uh, and so, yeah, we showed him some like plant-based football players and he was then okay with it. Um, and they were, they were, yeah, pretty much plant based. I mean, certainly at at birthday parties and uh, in social situations, if they made the choice to have something that was not plant based, we were okay with that um, because that's their choice, and we um, didn't want to make them feel too out of place or or uh, different from other kids, of course. But at home, that's what we were eating. You mentioned that your cholesterol lowered. Were there any other physical or mental changes that you saw? I can, yeah, I can actually share something that I haven't shared um, in the past beyond my my immediate family. I haven't shared on social media, but um, I had a, a pretty bad problem with constipation through my teenage years and, and young adult years. I would get very bad hemorrhoids mm. uh, like once a year, very uncomfortable. And um, in my mid-20s, I had an anal fissure, which is kind of a, a tear. It's a very uncomfortable, painful situation uh, when you're when you're straining so much to poop Mm -hmm. and i actually had a procedure by a surgeon to help me with that and the surgeon said to me if you don't want this to happen again uh, you gotta drink fiber drink every night drink you know metamucil right so from my mid-20s uh all through my 30s until i discovered the plant-based diet at age 42 every night i was drinking metamucil to have Uh, soft stools that I didn't have to strain for. And then I start the plant-based diet and I'm like pooping twice a day, (laughs) soft poops. And so even after all those years of drinking a fiber drink every night, I thought, you know, know, let me see uh, if I can do without it. So I actually in, yeah, when I went plant-based after I'd noticed this improvement after the first few months that, uh, I, uh, I didn't need the fiber drink anymore. So, uh, you know, pe- people talk about, oh, I need supplements on the plant-based diet. Well, here's a supplement I didn't need, right. a fiber supplement <laughs> uh, on the plant-based diet. And uh, so that was when I was 42. Uh, like I said, after many years of buying that product in bulk <laughs> mm. uh, so that I would have it every night, um, <laughs> that's a that's a bad pun in bulk. <laughs> but <laughs> um buying, yeah, um, I no longer needed a fiber supplement. So yeah, you asked me uh, about uh, a benefit and and I've been fine ever since. I no longer have the hemorrhoids. I'm pooping like clockwork, soft, soft poops, and it's not a strain, it's not a struggle anymore. So that that was a, a certainly a very nice physical benefit that that I actually haven't shared before because uh, it's kind of personal, but uh, I'm happy to share it here for others who might be struggling and, and considering the plant-based diet. That is a benefit, and that is a supplement you won't need anymore. That's very interesting. What do you attribute that to? Is it the fiber content? Yeah, I mean, I was eating the standard American diet before, which uh, they say that only 3% of Americans get enough fiber every day. Mm. And uh, compared with the historical record, uh, and, and that recommended daily allowance, I think, is something like 15 grams of fiber, which is uh, very minimal compared to the historical record where our, our prehistoric ancestors might have been eating up to 100 grams of fiber per day um, from the from the fossil record. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I probably wasn't getting enough fiber on the standard American diet. And, and uh, so the surgeon said, you got to get this fiber supplement. And that's what I was doing. Uh, now the plant-based diet is fiber is actually uh, shortened for plant fiber. Mm. Uh, so when you're eating the plant-based diet and you're getting all those whole plants, uh, you're getting a lot of fiber. And that certainly helps the microbiome. 
it helps you make soft poops and uh happy that i'm now in the the top three percent in the country for my fiber intake i'll say <laughs> how did that make you feel when you i mean for years 10 years or so more than 10 years you were taking this fiber supplement every single night yeah so yeah, how, yeah. how did that make you feel when you all of a sudden realized you didn't need it anymore yeah, I just had kind of resigned myself to it. That's the way it is. Uh, that's the way my body is. I guess I just need this supplement. Uh, so yeah, certainly happy not to have to spend the money on that product and happy not to have to, I mean, I would travel, I would put uh, the fiber supplement in, you know, I would buy it in bulk in these big cartons uh, and I would put it in a little Tupperware container for when I was traveling. I, I'd like measure out the the number of days. And uh, so yeah, carrying the fiber supplement always worried it would burst open in my and all my clothes would be orange <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i find that really interesting because uh, my experience was that i had uh what they called gerd and mm. um therefore i was on prilosec and that mm. was the one thing that i just didn't want to deal with anymore I didn't want to be on any pills or any kind of supplements or anything like that. So that's when I started to look into different diets and landed on the plant-based diet. Oh. So did you research other diets when you were taking this fiber supplement for over 10 years? Nope. I um, didn't think about it. Was a doctor even right. <laughs> had access to all the medical literature, I guess. But uh, I just kind of resigned myself that uh, that's the way that I was. Um, I mean, it, it kind of just goes to show how little nutrition is uh, emphasized in our training as doctors, um, right. how that's not the first thought the first i'm yeah I, I really wish i had a recording of what this surgeon said to me did he say to me oh consider the plant-based diet you know like, probably not that was mm -hmm. in the in the 90s yeah that was in the 90s and yeah um probably wouldn't have said such a thing i don't remember if he did but did he say something like oh you should eat more fiber or take this supplement or did he just say take the supplement i have a feeling that based on as another doctor and you know, mm -hmm. just as our training that's the go-to take this pill uh, have this surgery uh that's just what we're trained to do um as as doctors so um yeah i didn't think i didn't think beyond that uh until i learned about the plant-based diet from a cyclist not even uh in the medical field not even a, a me another medical colleague what is it about nutrition that they don't teach doctors. Why, why is that? Well, we did learn nutrition. Actually, so I went to Tufts School of Medicine, mm -hmm. uh, which actually has a pretty respected nutrition school. I was actually a participant in some research studies for pay in medical school. The researchers would come to our uh, classrooms and say, hey, we're paying 50 bucks if you, <laughs> you can take your blood here. We're okay. paying 50 <laughs> bucks if you, yeah, people. Um, a friend of mine, um, she got paid 1,200 bucks to do a research study where they were going to biopsy her muscle. Wow. And she and, her, she and her husband used that money for an Alaskan cruise. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there, there were opportunities for sure there. Um, but uh, so yeah, this was a school that was, um, you know, very cognizant of nutrition, but my nutrition classes, and the, like they, they say that only 25% of medical schools even have uh, nutrition classes. Um, so I had nutrition classes. I was in the minority mm -hmm. uh, getting nutrition classes, but the nutrition classes were about these very rare uh deficiencies like allegra niacin deficiency mm -hmm. like things things that you don't see anymore they're good uh to learn about academically so you learn mechanisms of action and symptoms and things like that um but they're they're not uh what we're experiencing what we're seeing in our offices every day you know not seeing those particular deficiencies although i i, I must uh, i must say that i did uh, diagnose scurvy twice over my career Mm. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, I'm happy to say that I learned about vitamin C deficiency in, uh, in medical school, but for the most part, uh, the medical students, uh, their career, they're going to be seeing, uh, diseases of overconsumption, not underconsumption. They're going to be seeing, uh, diseases of, uh, too much of these vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates and fats and sugars and, 
and proteins and all the all the diseases associated with uh, too much stuff. And uh, unfortunately, at least the medical school that I went to, that wasn't the case. Now, um, when I was working at uh, Hackensack University Medical Center, they founded a brand new medical school. And I got on the um, planning committee, the design team for the nutrition classes. And so I actually taught, was able to uh, teach a class of first year medical students about nutrition and specifically about the plant-based diet and specifically about plant-based diet for obesity. Mm. And the response was actually very interesting uh, from the from the class. Which well, what was the response? So, um, the, you know, they, they fill out feedback afterwards mm-hmm. and, uh, and I got the feedback. So um, a lot of the feedback was that this was not rigorous for medical school, that uh, mm. this maybe should be an elective uh, class hmm. or a lunchtime chat um, kind of thing. There were several people that uh, felt that it ne- didn't necessarily belong. Learning about the plant-based diet, especially because there are so many different diets out there, the mm-hmm. you know, low-carb, Mediterranean, yada, yada, yada. So they, they felt maybe also it was unfair that they were learning about this particular diet and not hearing about all the diets, which which, yeah, that's appropriate. You should learn about all the pros and cons of all the diets. So I, I had uh, monopolized them with the uh, plant-based diet mm-hmm. uh, because that's the one I think is the best. But uh, uh, yeah, so there was that. But then there was also um, some nice positive feedback. Uh, for example, one uh, first-year medical student contacted me afterwards uh, and wanted to do a project with me about the plant-based diet specifically for um, low-income families mm-hmm. and how it can be, uh, you know, people have this concept that it's um, ex- too expensive, but uh, certainly uh, if if you're not eating all the processed uh, mm-hmm. uh, plant-based products and you're focusing, like Dr. McCool says, on on the, the starches, then uh, it can be a very, a very cost-saving kind of diet. Um, so we we did a project together. So uh, I was very touched that she uh, was mo- um, inspired enough by my talk to try to try to do a project together that we and so we did that over the next few years. And then um, also what was touching was that uh, when I gave the presentation, uh, the movie Game Changers was mm-hmm. coming out. Mm-hmm. And so I mentioned that to uh, to the class. And a few days later, um, the a local college in New Jersey was having a Q&A, a premiere of the Game Changers movie with uh, John Stewart, who's one of the producers, and mm-hmm. several of the um, people that appeared in the movie, like um, uh, some of the athletes and the firefighter was there. I just specifically remember the, mm-hmm. the fire, one of the firefighters was there. Uh, and three medical students from the class made it a point to find me at the premiere and come over and say, hey, Dr. Andrew, we really liked your talk. We wanted to learn more. We're here at the this movie um and so i was really you know as a teacher that's the kind of thing that really really touches you so i'm hoping that those little uh seeds were planted if you will Mm -hmm. and that they will continue at least in the back of their mind uh considering nutrition and considering the plant-based diet when they're seeing all their patients with heart disease and diabetes and uh, hypertension and obesity which is the kind of nutritional diseases that we're seeing every day as doctors, not niacin deficiency kind of diseases that I learned about. Mm -hmm. What is it about that disconnect between the doctors and nutrition? Why do people not connect the dots? I think as doctors, we feel very powerful with the pills that we have and the procedures that we have and the plant-based or, or I should say any nutrition intervention seems less powerful. Mm. But I think I think that we have that kind of backwards. Um, I also give grand rounds to hospitals. So um, uh, grand rounds are a time for a department like pediatrics or internal medicine or, or gynecology, a department to get together. It's usually like once a week. And mm-hmm. then maybe there are administrative tasks that they need to go over or they have a guest speaker come in. So I've been since 2017, I've been giving grand rounds to pediatric hospitals around New York and New Jersey. So I um, gave one a a few weeks ago about the plant-based diet for pediatric hypertension. Mm -hmm. And I showed some slides that showed that with a salt reduction, just a thousand milligrams per day, less salt, 
can reduce your risk of a heart attack over a 10 year period of time. This is for adults mm -hmm. over a 10 year period of time by 25%. Wow. Now, a drug <laughs> that reduces the risk of heart attack, it would be a billion dollar blockbuster if it reduced someone's risk of a heart attack over 10 years by 5%. <laughs> wow. You would you would be uh, accused of malpractice if you did not prescribe such a drug that could have such a massive 5% improvement in mm -hmm. risk. And here I'm saying, if you can get someone to eat 1,000 milligrams less salt, you can lower their risk of a heart attack by 25%? Right. That it, it should be malpractice if you don't mention that to a family, in my mind. Yeah. But you know, as doctors, we're taught about all the benefits of the drugs we prescribe, but maybe we're not getting the perspective, the proportion. Uh, and then also you think the drugs are expensive. They have side effects. Yeah. What's the side effect of, of reducing salt in your diet? I can't you get healthier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the you know your blood pressure might go too low i don't yeah. know <laughs> um, yeah so so uh, this is this is when i'm talking to student doctors when i'm talking to medical students this is the kind of um uh, paradigm i'm trying to have them then change that yes yes the drugs are powerful the surgeries are powerful the procedures are powerful for sure but there is another powerful tool out there and that's that's nutrition i think that that's a fair assessment that it's a, a powerful tool in your toolbox and that yep. if, if you feel that as a doctor, if you feel that this is the better tool, then people should use that tool. It's, it's kind of like, you know, have you heard the expression, uh, if you give someone a hammer, every problem's a nail. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, you know, as doctors, we're taught how to do procedures, how to, how to prescribe the medicines. And so then the problem is that then every, pro every problem seems like we can fix that way. But there are problems out there that aren't nails. There are problems out there that I like to say are screwdrivers, like the obesity epidemic. We, we need a different tool for, for these kind of problems. If we could just go back to your plant-based journey for a second. Okay. How did that feel when you started to notice all the changes that were coming? Yeah, certainly felt, felt healthier. Uh, mm -hmm. felt more energy. I mean, the plant-based diet is uh, very heavy on complex carbohydrates. So it's, you kind of feel like you're a marathon runner every day that you, you get up and go, you have all that energy from carbo loading, mm -hmm. uh, the good kind of carbs that you get in plants. So um, yeah, especially with all the cycling I do, it feels great. I noticed my recovery time after a hard bike ride is I'm ready to go again the next day. Um, put on the miles and and just really enjoy the cycling more uh, with more energy. But uh, yeah, my you asked uh, a few questions ago about mental and and feeling is is that yeah uh, as I learn more about the plant based diet about the environmental benefits about animal welfare, um, I, it just uh, I'm happier knowing that I'm not uh, a part of those kind of problems that I'm I'm causing less environmental strain on the planet that we are all inhabitants for a brief period of time on um causing less harm to the animals and uh it's nice not to be part of that harsh i mean they, they say that if uh if slaughterhouses had glass walls everyone would be vegan mm -hmm. or vegetarian at least but uh it's uh it's just feels good not to be part of that uh process anymore to just like um, I kind of think it's almost like stepping out of society, but but society is sick right now. Mm. Um, I don't eat like everyone else because I don't want to get the diseases that everyone else is getting. I don't eat like everyone else because I don't want to be contributing so much to the uh, you know animal hardships and uh, all the horrible stuff that's going on to the animals anymore. I don't eat like everyone else because I don't want to be contributing all that environmental damage that animal agriculture does. So uh, it, it's stepping out of society that can feel lonely mm. uh, for people. Um, and and you hear sometimes about uh, increased de depression among vegans, you know, when, when they mm. learn about the horrors that are going on in animal agriculture and stuff and, and to feel lonely um, is uh is certainly a, a, a risk, but uh, thankfully my wife and my kids are with me and uh, I have communities online 
uh, that uh, support me and I support them. And so feeling uh, a little bit out of society, but feeling a little bit like that's uh, better for my mental health um, and uh, feeling happier because of all of it. It's interesting that you say that because that was one of the reasons that I started the podcast was because mm -hmm. I felt lonely. I felt like I, I needed community. I needed people that were like me that this way I didn't feel like I was the only one. And I think that that's an important thing that people don't realize as when they are going vegan, that there's a lot of pressure on us to eat the way everybody else eats and it, and you're taking this lead and you're just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing. And, and that can be hard, you know, being a leader can be hard. Yeah. When I'm working with the families as a pediatrician, I very upfront with families who are considering taking this leap is that, um, you don't have to portion restrict. You can be full on hearty plants and there's a wide range of varieties of plants you can eat. You can find the plants you like. Uh, so you don't have to feel deprived. You don't even have to feel restricted. You know, there's just tens of thousands of plants you can eat. Um, and you don't, if you're doing it for weight loss, you don't even have to be a fanatical exerciser. Uh, the weight can come off without really overdoing it or having to exercise more than you're feeling comfortable with. But uh, the hard part is that you have to be and feel different from everyone else. And mm. sometimes, sometimes the teenagers are like, whatever, like I, I'm forming my identity now, and this is an identity I want to embrace. And then, uh, some, for some of the kids, you know, it's, uh, it's just, uh, a horror show to bring a brown bag lunch to, uh, the cafeteria mm -hmm. <laughs> that's uh, just more than they're comfortable with. So, yeah. And, uh, I'm trying to be upfront with the families that I'm working with that that's the struggle. Let's get to Dr. Herbivore, which is your telehealth practice. When did you start Dr. Herbivore and what was the reason for starting it? I was working at Hackensack University Medical Center, major medical center in New Jersey, uh, as a pediatric kidney doctor, so taking care of kids with kidney disease uh, for 16 years. And then for the past three years uh, before I left, I uh, was also working in the pediatric weight management program. Uh, helping families that were struggling with obesity. And then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And in uh, 2020, my hospital pivoted quickly to telemedicine uh, so that I was seeing families like this online mm -hmm. uh, uh, for their kidney care and for their um, working with the obesity program. And the families loved it. They could, uh, they didn't have to drive. They didn't have to sit in the waiting room with someone coughing on them. Uh, they didn't have to park, all the stresses. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I liked it because uh, I could pull in family members who uh, maybe uh, it wasn't as easy for them to get to the doctor's office. Um, or I could also do surprise uh, kitchen inspections. <laughs> We're mm -hmm. like, hey, show me your kitchen. And uh, not that I was cataloging all of their foods, but it would be interesting, the reactions, they'd be like, Oh, Dr. Andrew, look at all the fruits and vegetables here. Or, oh, Dr. Andrew, I'm not going to show you what's in this drawer. <laughs> um, so, you know, just getting their kind of reactions as to what might be going on uh, in the kitchen at home. And so uh, I was thinking I could do this myself, I could take the parts of the job that I'd like, and uh, do this telehealth program uh, throughout the state. Uh, and I, I kept my New Jersey license. I got the New York state license also. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could reach out even to underserved communities and I could offer a, a more widely available program, um, especially for the pediatric weight management, uh, which for at, at, uh, at my hospital was a kind of a very rigid structured program uh, that had a a large attrition rate uh, people would drop out mm -hmm. because it was just kind of, it was over a long period of time, uh, every like Tuesday night kind of thing. And, uh, that as families, as their schedules changed through the seasons kind of made it hard. So, but if I can do telehealth, I can make it much more flexible. So in 2021, I, I left the hospital and founded this Dr. Herbert program with the specific goal of helping families that, uh, want to thrive while being plant-based mm -hmm. and also, uh, if they're, if, for example, families that were already uh, raising vegetarian or vegan children and wanted to kind of learn how to do it right, um, especially if they couldn't uh, approach their own pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of families tell me, oh, the doctor, Andrew, you're telling me that my child doesn't need milk, but my pediatrician is telling me my child does need milk. Right. And uh, even my own kids, I take them to the pediatrician and, and the pediatrician is like, where are you getting your protein? And my kids would like <laughs> roll their eyes. Um, 
So I wanted to provide this uh, service to families who want to kind of learn and be reassured about how to raise a plant-based child uh, well so they can thrive. And then also my interest in the pediatric obesity epidemic. So offering a program uh, specifically very flexible and very supportive, very comprehensive for families that are struggling with obesity and want to learn how to eat more plant-based, plant-strong fruits, vegetables, starches, whole grains for weight management, or more so as to not focus on necessarily on the scale uh, for better health. What has been the reaction to Dr. Herbivore? Uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to kind of, it's such a niche kind of pra practice mm -hmm. uh, that um, it's a struggle to get people to understand exactly what I'm offering. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, um, they, they might be looking for a general pediatrician, but I, I can't offer those services because it's all telehealth. So I can't do like a sports physical or, or uh, you know, give vaccines or things like that are, are typically done in the office. So uh, it's been a little bit of struggle. And then also I, I don't take insurance. Um, which is another uh, hurdle that families have to overcome is that uh, I really, uh, what I offer wouldn't be covered by insurance because uh, I offer the, in these programs, frequent telehealth visits, uh, e-courses so that uh, the families can learn at their own pace at home uh, and kind of in between telehealth visits, I can give them homework and uh, assignments to the e-courses and then come back and discuss. I have a plant-based chef Mm -hmm. that I work with. So for a family who uh, needs needs or wants to learn some cooking skills or wants to learn some new recipes, uh, she will meet them virtually online and uh, and uh, work with them. And then one of your previous guests, Daniel Medina, mm -hmm. is a, um, a youth fitness expert who uh, I have connect with families also that, so that she can uh, work on either strength or conditioning or flexibility or even meditation. So uh, dealing with stress, things like that. So uh, I offer a lot of different services that uh, wouldn't be covered by insurance and uh, try to have this very comprehensive program uh, for the families that are struggling with obesity or families that just want to raise uh, healthy uh, vegan vegetarian children. Seems like such a great idea and such a great <laughs> program. It really does. I mean, you got chefs, you got fitness people, and then obviously yourself as an expert. It sounds like such a great program. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, as a father of three plant-based kids, there's always been some pushback, right, with my pediatrician over the years. And it, it hasn't been, it's nothing major, you know. It, there Again, it's probably more out of curiosity than anything else. But their growth and weight charts are always perfect and everything always looks great. What would you suggest for parents like myself to watch for in order to make sure that your kids are growing up healthy on a plant-based diet? Right. So definitely want to make sure the kids, like you said, are, are growing. Uh, we say in pediatrics, you only get one chance to grow. Mm. So by the time your growth plates are fused as a teenager, uh, you're not going to get any more growth out. So it is very important to ensure adequate growth. And so the plant-based diet for children, especially young growing children, is going to be a little different than a plant-based diet for adults who maybe wants to prevent or even reverse disease. Um, specifically, if you're going whole foods, plant-based, no added oils, uh, which is shown in the evidence to be very heart healthy, mm -hmm. but uh, that might not give enough calories for a growing child uh, because a growing child has a small stomach, much smaller than an adult's. And it fills quickly. This is why kids are always looking for snacks is because the three meals a day, they might just eat a small portion, fill up, uh, leave the table and then be hungry again an hour later. That's just the nature of their smaller digestive tract. So uh, a child who's filling up so quickly, if they're having a lot of high fiber, high water content, low calorie foods uh, without the oils that, that can also boost the calories up, um, then I, I do worry about them uh, not uh, achieving adequate growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's all the other like micronutrients we just got to make sure are there, like the iron and things like that. So um, if anything, want to make sure that they're getting the adequate. And I use a program called Chronometer, mm -hmm. uh, which is free online. So uh, doing a food diary to making sure that they're meeting all those goals and uh, teaching the families that I work with how to use the program so that they can continue after they're done working with me. Uh, to help the child reach their goals. But uh, that's the one thing. And uh, we really want to make sure that 
and the pediatricians all, and th this is what they do anyway, but checking their growth curves and catching any problem before, uh, before it's, it's too late. Uh, right. So what's the first question that you get from parents about a plant-based diet? Oh, where do you get your protein? <laughs> do you tell them the store, same place as everybody else? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all from, from the plants. Uh, where does the cow get the protein to make the juicy steaks? It, it, it eats grass. I have a whole a whole spiel. Uh -huh. uh, and in my, my e-courses, I have uh, whole lessons uh, about this this uh, protein concern. But, I mean, just, just uh, look, again, uh, we didn't learn about protein. Uh, protein deficiency in medical school that anyone is seeing these days. They actually changed the name. It's no longer called a protein deficiency. Uh, it's called protein calorie deficiency uh, mm -hmm. because it was recognized that there's really no such thing as a protein deficiency. If you, There's protein in so just about everything that mm -hmm. it's really hard to uh, to create a diet, a, a meal plan that that lacks protein. And this this uh, obsession with protein, I think, has just gotten out of hand. There's mm -hmm. there's just no protein deficiency going on in this country. Uh, the problem is overconsumption. And uh, I actually um, I I did a little experiment earlier this year mm -hmm. uh, where uh, I varied my protein intake and measured my 24 hour urine nitrogen waste output mm -hmm. uh, basically using my powers as a kidney doctor uh, because the protein that's metabolized and broken down uh, ends up as nitrogen in your urine and i showed in my little experiment uh and this is available I, you can see on my on my website under the media tab a uh, video of of the results uh basically showed that uh, when i really went out of my way to eat a lot more protein plant-based protein uh, a lot of it just ended up in my urine, uh, and mm. a lot of it even wasn't absorbed. That uh, more must have come out in my in my poop, uh, all, along with the, the ex all the uh, fiber I was eating. Right. But uh, yeah, so uh, I say, you know, if you're looking at these protein bars, protein shakes, uh, protein supplements, and stuff like that, that uh, a lot of it is just getting flushed down the toilet. Mm. That's interesting. Do you feel that we overcompensate for protein and actually eat too much protein? Right. Um, not that that's necessarily harmful. Uh, people have a fear that too much protein is going to hurt the kidneys, but the kidneys are perfectly happy to urinate out the protein waste, uh, the nitrogenous waste. We don't mm -hmm. urinate out protein. The liver breaks down the protein and what we don't use, we cannot store. So we just urinate out the waste. Um, that's not a problem. What's the problem is the what comes with the protein. When you're eating animal protein, uh, you're getting the trans fat, you're getting the cholesterol, you're getting the salt, uh, you're getting uh, possible carcinogens mm -hmm. uh, in the animal products. And uh, so that's the concern is these people that are really going out of their way in this desperate uh, search for protein, thinking that's going to make them healthier, uh, probably peeing out a lot of that protein as waste, and then getting a lot of stuff that, that your body doesn't want, like all those other uh, molecules that have been shown through studies to be bad for our hearts and uh, bad for our, our cardiovascular system. Now, what is it about caring for children that makes you so passionate? I, well, yeah, I, ever since medical school, uh, this might might be bad to say, but when I was taking care of uh, older people, more mature people, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of had less sympathy for them if they had been smoking and drinking and and sure. all their whole life, and then coming in with diseases. I felt like, yeah, certainly someone needs to take care of those problems, but not necessarily me. Uh, kids are, I feel, more innocent and uh, uh, haven't uh, necessarily brought their Ill ailments on themselves. And uh, so I was drawn to to taking care of the kids. Um, I really enjoyed the taking care of the kids and the families, um, especially when there were chronic diseases like kidney diseases. Not that I wish that anyone has chronic kidney disease, but the kids with chronic kidney disease, we would get to see them often. And uh, because it was necessary for their care, uh, working through chronic kidney disease, dialysis, kidney transplant, um, that was kind of, that was a, uh, rewarding for me that we would have such a close uh, as the caregivers of these families 
have a, such a close bond with the families. And as a pediatric kidney doctor and the one hospital for 16 years, seeing these kids uh, grow up and uh, like I would even write letters of recommendation uh, for these kids' college applications, uh, just knowing them so well uh, and seeing the, them as they came over such adversities through their chronic chronic kidney disease, I kind of wanted the colleges to know, despite all of their uh, challenges, their health challenges, then so it gave me great pleasure, uh, not only to help them uh, achieve their best health through their childhood with these unfortunate chronic kidney diseases, but also hopefully their best education, their 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 best life ahead of them. Um, so that's what gave me a great pleasure. And then I'm taking that over now, uh, transitioning to the pediatric obesity, which uh, is much more common than, mm. um, than uh, kidney disease in kids. Unfortunately, it's very common now. And the pediatric obesity is having such uh, impacts on kids, not only risk factors for later in life for diabetes or heart disease later in life, but there are kids now that are being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. It was called adult onset diabetes when I was in medical school, right. but now it's called type 2 diabetes because there are teenagers and 10-year-olds and 8-year-olds getting it. Um, so also things, again, talking about education and, and helping someone, uh, young people with obesity uh, have a great risk of obstructive sleep apnea. Mm. So they're not getting a good night's sleep, and that has been shown to affect their academic performance the next day. So yeah, we can worry about obesity causing all sorts of health problems over years and decades, but there are kids that are struggling in school right now uh, because of their uh, on obesity. And so uh, it, now it's given me great pleasure to help families that are struggling with obesity, which is not their fault, uh, no more than kidney disease in a child is the child's fault. Uh, really try to maximize their health and their potential uh, going forward. And and even if that means helping them get a better night's sleep uh, so that they can perform at their best potential in school. Now, do you see a direct correlation between the parents? Is there is it a possibility that a parent can be healthy and in shape and a child be obese? Yes, yes, that happens. Um, the The main concern is that the parent has obesity, and if one or two parents have obesity, then there's a 70-80% chance in the studies that their child will have obesity too. So uh, yes, certainly working with the children, but also working with the parents, uh, especially if the, because the parent is probably the one uh, shopping for food and preparing food. So it's it's great when you can help the whole family, uh, especially uh, we were talking about loneliness before. You don't want to isolate one person in the family and uh, make them feel different by having to have different meals than everyone else. But uh, yeah, there's all sorts of combinations of, of uh, uh, parents and children with obesity, but um, more often than not, uh, they, they tend to run together that the whole family has obesity. Now, where did you get the courage to leave your other job and just start Dr. Herbivore? Yeah, that was a, a big leap. I had been an employee my whole career uh, working in hospitals and then to strike out on my own business. I just felt like it was, it was time. And uh, if there's any benefit to uh, COVID, it was uh, exposing me to the benefits of telehealth mm. uh, and seeing that as an option, uh, how much the families uh, appreciated it, how much I uh, liked it also as a tool. Uh, so, um, you know, there is a lot of, there's a, there is a lot of talk about doctor burnout. I, I don't know if I was per se burned out on medicine at that time, uh, that I did leave, I really enjoyed and I miss and I stay in touch with my colleagues that um, that I was working with. And I, I really enjoyed the patients. Uh, some doctors, unfortunately, they don't enjoy their patients, um, but I, I was still enjoying my patients. Uh, the hard parts of the job at the time was the electronic health record mm. uh, in that uh, I, I, I was frustrated at, as to how much data entry I was doing is I'd have a very nice uh, visit with a family and then I'd have to go uh, and sit in front of the computer and and document every little little detail for 
for the insurance purposes. And that was frustrating or the billing purposes. Um, and the schedule was kind of getting to me um, uh, all the nights and weekends and missed family time also uh, was getting to me, um, es especially um, uh, after so many years and having young children at home and stuff. Uh, that was what was getting me. So I took the leap. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, was it was it courage or was it foolishness? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but I, I took the leap and it's been a, a great learning experience for me, learning all the business aspects of running a practice and and all the technology uh, that is sometimes helpful and sometimes frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's uh, it's been a good learning experience. And I always like learning new things. So this is this is what I'm learning now how to do this. No, I I can't get over how I I personally think it's a fantastic thing. So I think you're doing the right thing. So Thank I you. mean, there's there's plenty of shall we just say there's plenty of doctors doing the the normal doctor thing. Okay, mm -hmm. the, I don't know if we have enough people who are in your situation where you're uh, promoting a plant based diet as well as trying to help people that are obese. I mean, like with the, as we were talking before about the, the fitness and the, and the chef and, and people that are helping you to help these people. I think it's fantastic. Now, what is one thing that's exciting for you right now in your life or with Dr. Herbivore? Um, just, uh, I enjoy all the peating people, all the people that I'm meeting like you, um, who are help spreading the plant-based message. Um, all the the networking and and marketing that I've been doing for Dr. Herbor, uh, just uh, what has been very enjoyable is meeting uh, colleagues and and forming relationships and and uh, really learning how different people uh, uh, attack this problem of mm -hmm. uh, spreading the plant based message. Uh, so that that's been very exciting for me. Um, I'm part of a community called Whole Communities. Uh, which was a uh, forum that was formed by Dr. Campbell mm -hmm. uh, from his Center for Nutrition Studies. And it's a group of people that are firmly plant-based um, that are learning and discussing how to spread the plant-based message. And uh, I'm a moderator of that group. And I've met some really fantastic people making changes in their communities and uh, supporting supporting each other. So uh, for uh, I'll just give an example of the things that kind of go on in there is that mm -hmm. there was a woman there who um, made a post that she is running a, a middle school and high school um, like running event mm -hmm. uh, in her community. And uh, she wanted uh, not to serve the typical donuts at the finish line mm. and was asking for advice. Uh, what kind of more healthier plant-based food could she serve to kind of show these young athletes um, how to uh, nourish themselves after after an event? So I uh, sent over her uh, in in our group discussion. Sent her some ideas like maybe getting a food truck that makes smoothies or, mm. or uh, wraps or something like that. Or I also saw that there was um, uh, in her community there was two. Uh, vegan pizza, uh, two pizza places that served vegan pizza. Mm. Uh, and so, it, you know, if the teenagers are going to want pizza afterwards, but let's see if they might enjoy sampling some vegan pizza, at least mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Um, so, and, and other people had other ideas. So that's the kind of discussions that go on in this group uh, on whole communities. If uh, anyone's interested in, in joining us there. Not vegan donuts. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's where I go. Yeah, vegan. Yeah, Just give me some vegan she donuts. Was, she was at. Yeah, she was asking for not a, very a healthy. healthier alternative. Um, yeah, it's it's well, it's frustrating when when I do these I do cycling events and and sometimes they serve donuts at the rest stop or um, a big big uh, chafing dishes of fettuccine Alfredo at the at the uh, finish line. It's like mm -hmm. oh, um, I've, I've I've brought my own stuff to some of these events when I've had a suspicion that there wasn't going to be food for me. Which uh, you know you pay these exorbitant entrance fees. You you like it at least to uh, have the consideration of for some us plant based folk out there. Often I'll I'll contact them beforehand if there's any question and see what's mm. going on for for the cycling events I do. Now why is it that you named it Doctor Herbivore? 
Yeah, so um, uh, when uh, when someone is uh, looking to me uh, for advice, I want them to kind of know that it's going to be more plant based advice, uh, plant strong advice. So I wanted to have some kind of indication in the name that uh, that's what they were getting so as to not surprise folks, because sometimes I would do that. And they would be like, well, wait, what's this plant based diet you're talking about? <laughs> um, so at least they know that I'm, I'm an herbivore. But I like I like the name herbivore also. Uh, be, it it, it kind of has some more meaning to me than just saying a uh, vegan or or plant based mm-hmm. because uh, it has some significance in that. I'm um, it reminds me that uh, I'm part of the ecosystem. You know that I'm an inhabitant of this planet. And on the food chain, uh, I'm an herbivore, mm-hmm. and uh, that I just want to eat plants. And um, uh, it also reminds me that uh, herbivores are constantly being worried about uh, uh, being attacked by a carnivore, for example. Mm-hmm. So I'm not so worried about being attacked by a carnivore, but the threats to human beings these days is uh, disease, is heart disease, is obesity, is hypertension, diabetes. These are the threats that are attacking us. And my hope is that as an herbivore, the studies show that as plant-based that I'm reducing my risk of developing uh, those outcomes uh, of being attacked by the standard American diet, Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, full of animal products, full of processed foods, and uh, unfortunately, uh, likely to cause some of those those outcomes for people. If you, you can see it in the obesity epidemic, the hypertension epidemic, the diabetes epidemic. So once again, it, like we were talking about before, it kind of reminds me to eat differently than everyone else. Eat as an herbivore, uh, always in the back of my mind, thinking about the threats to my to my health. Uh, mm. And to the planet. Yeah, yeah, we are part, we are just uh, visitors here. Or we are, we're, we're just renters here, I should say. <laughs> you know, we're only on this as individuals, we're only on this planet for a little bit of time. We want to leave it to the next inhabitants in uh, some uh, okay condition and and as an herbivore, uh, causing less uh, environmental damage. What is one hack or tip or another way that helps you stay on track with your plant-based diet? I'm finding after nine years, I'm finding it um, pretty easy. I guess I've developed habits and routines um, if anything, uh, I would say for people that are newer starting out is uh, to um, kind of plan ahead. Like I said, I'll, I'll contact an organization if I know I'm going to be someplace. Um, uh, I'm giving a talk uh, in New Jersey next week, and I'm going to be with this group uh, all day and wanted to make sure that they had plant-based vegan options for me, and they do. Um, so, yeah, that kind of thing, uh, planning ahead. Um but uh, yeah, and and don't don't be afraid to bring it up. When my wife and I were first uh, turned plant based, we found ourselves at uh, one of our favorite uh, boutique burger hamburger places, just kind of out of habit. Mm-hmm. And so we uh, we asked the waiter, and uh, we're like, "Oh, can we get the the black bean burger? No cheese, no butter on the bun." And uh, he's like. He's like, oh, are you guys vegan? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're new. We're like, yeah. And he's like, he's like, oh, our our head chef is vegan. I'll have her whip whip you up something. And we're like, really? So in this boutique burger place, the mm. uh, chef in the back with all the patties uh, was vegan herself and and made us a nice vegan dinner. So it, it was a good lesson for us in those early stages to just to just ask. Um, eat, even if you find yourself at a boutique burger place. Right. What is the most rewarding thing that you do? It's really nice. So when I was um, doing the pediatric nephrology, a lot of patients would come to me with high blood pressure. Uh, The local pediatricians would detect high blood pressure on their physicals and send it to me because in kids that can often be a sign of a kidney problem. So Mm. I want to rule out kidney problems, heart problems, uh, hormone problems, and then I'd be sitting there with families uh, discussing how to manage their high blood pressure. And I could make blood pressure go away so easily with a medicine. But when I would prescribe the medicines, um, the families would often be like, oh, well, how long do we have to take this right. <laughs> for the rest of our life? You know, they, they, were, they were concerned. 
But if I would get a family that was interested in making dietary and lifestyle changes, and I could send them uh, on that path, give them the information, give them the plant-based diet uh, studies, uh, give them uh, the steps to take to uh, go plant-based. And then for some of the families I was getting, getting them off of blood pressure medicines or not having to start blood pressure medicines because their blood pressure would improve on the plant-based diet kind of tailored to be more low salt. Mm -hmm. um, then they would come back to me and say, thank you. And they wouldn't have to start the medicine. Then they'd say, thank you. So you, so you asked me what's like most professionally rewarding for me is to have someone uh, be appreciative that I've given them the tools uh, to lead a healthier life. And, and that's what really feels good to me these days. Now, finally, can you give me one word to describe how you felt before you became vegan and one word to describe how you feel now that you are vegan? Yeah, I was feeling, I think the one word would be pretty clueless. Mm. Um, even with, with all of my medical education and all the degrees and all the, the science and even participating as a research study in, in uh, nutrition studies, I, I found out that I was actually kind of pretty clueless. I was very uh, well-trained in disease, mm -hmm. but still kind of clueless about health. And so it was only when I really became plant-based and learned about all these aspects of the plant-based diet that, that I don't feel clueless anymore. I feel like I can really help someone. And so the other, the other word I would say is that I'm inspired now, mm. uh, that I'm really inspired to share what I've learned with people, uh, make it easily digestible um, on uh, whatever level you're coming, whatever background you're coming with uh, to help you, uh, my families that I'm working with, help them understand the benefits of the plant-based diet uh, through the visits, through the e-courses, through the colleagues that I'm working with, the chef and the youth fitness expert, really trying to make it, uh, I'm inspired to help make it make it easy for families, make it doable for families and uh, so that they can really take the steps and I can guide them. And so that's what I'm really inspired to do these days. That's the word for me, inspired. That's fantastic. I love that. It's such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. What is the best way for people to follow you and support you on the web and social media? Oh, please come to my Dr. Herbivore website, Dr. Spelled Out and then herbivore.com. And uh, there are all sorts of links there to my social media uh, where I have some content, not a lot, but when I'm inspired, I put some content up. Um, and then also links to my e-courses, um, especially if you are if you want to learn more about uh, the plant-based diet for kids. There's a lot of information out there for adults, plant-based, um, but not a lot for kids. So uh, it was important to me to make some accessible uh, information for kids out there, for families that are raising plant-based kids. Um, so I have the e-courses, links to those on the website. And then um, if you're in New York or New Jersey, where I have my um, license to practice medicine mm -hmm. and uh, are interested in my telehealth practice, there's uh, links to meet up with me, offer a 15, free 15 minute phone consultation. I can see if I can help you meet your goals. Uh, so all that's available on the Dr. Herbore website. That's great. Thanks again, Lee, for being on Plant Your Seed. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks a lot for these interesting questions. It's been a very pleasant conversation. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.